Hi, this is Brian Schwartz from the University of California, San Francisco. I'm an infectious diseases doctor, and now I'll be speaking with you about treatment and prevention of bacterial meningitis. The learning objectives for this session are for you to list, be able to list the key factors in choosing antibiotics to treat bacterial meningitis, for you be, to be able to prescribe an appropriate empiric antibiotic regimen for bacterial meningitis based on the patient's age, know the key prevention strategies for preventing different types of bacterial meningitis. So taking a step back and thinking about treatment, what makes a good antibiotic for treating meningitis? And I think it's really important that everybody is aware of the three key pieces. One, given that this is an infection that happens in the cerebral spinal fluid, you must use an antibiotic that achieves high concentrations in the cerebral spinal fluid. Two, you would like to have an antibiotic that is bactericidal in that it is able to kill the antibiotic, excuse me, that it's able to kill the bacteria in the absence of the immune system, uh, particularly in the cerebral spinal fluid, in the CNS is a privileged space where it is hard to get a good immune response, so it's really key that you have a very effective antibiotic. And three, when you're choosing your antibiotic, not only do you want to be able to get into the cerebral spinal fluid and be bactericidal, but you want it to be active against the common bacteria that cause meningitis. So you want to pick an empiric regimen that has the right spectrum. So this table, I think, does a nice job of showing what the common empiric antibiotics are for each bacterial meningitis pathogen. It's really um, for reference, but as you can see here, the third generation cephalosporins, most commonly cefotaxime or ceftriaxone, are the ones that are used. And this would work well for group B strep, E. coli, strep pneumo, um, Neisseria meningitidis, and H. influenza. However, there's two caveats here. One, Listeria monocytogenes, third generation cephalosporins are not active, so ampicillin is the drug of choice. And then for Streptococcus pneumoniae, you see it says third generation cephalosporin plus vancomycin. And we didn't talk about methicillin resistant Staph aureus as being a common pathogen in bacterial meningitis. So why is vancomycin recommended in this situation? Well, the reason that the vancomycin should be used here is because there's increasing penicillin resistance in Streptococcus pneumoniae, and some of that penicillin resistance um, in Strep pneumo is also cephalosporin resistant. So we recommend giving vancomycin up front until we have the results of those tests back to make sure we're treating appropriately. So based on what we have talked about in previous sessions and what we just reviewed as an appropriate regimen for these different bacteria, this table summarizes for neonates what the common pathogens are and what an, an empiric regimen should look like. So for here, for the neonates example, we worry about group B strep or strep A galactiae, E. coli, and Listeria monocytogenes. So therefore, the third generation cephalosporin would be active against um, e. coli also would be active against group A strep. And then ampicillin is for the Listeria monocytogenes, although that would also be active against group B strep. For children, we were worried about strep pneumo, H. flu, and Neisseria meningitidis. There, a third generation cephalosporin would be good for Neisseria and H. flu. And then the combination of a cephalosporin plus vancomycin is going to be used as an empiric regimen for strep pneumo. Young adults primarily worried about Neisseria meningitis and strep pneumo, and for the same reasons, a third generation cephalosporin plus vancomycin is what we'd recommend. And lastly, you can see for adults over the age of 50, when Listeria monocytogenes becomes common enough that we would change our empiric regimen to cover it, and you can see that we're recommending a third generation cephalosporin plus vancomycin plus ampicillin to cover the Listeria. So how do you determine directed antibiotic therapy? So directed therapy is you after you know your pathogen, you want to narrow um, and pick the most narrow spectrum antibiotic that's going to be effective. So for bacterial meningitis, let's do an example here. You have a 63-year-old man who came in with bacterial meningitis. You started an empiric regimen of ceftriaxone, vancomycin, and ampicillin to cover the common pathogens associated with bacterial meningitis. You ended up doing a lumbar puncture, and you got a CSF culture reveal, streptococcus pneumoniae. 
So therefore, at that point, you could stop the ampicillin when you knew it was you knew it was Streptococcus pneumoniae because you're not worried about Listeria anymore. Then you got susceptibility testing back on that strep pneumo, and you knew that strep pneumo was penicillin susceptible. So therefore, you could stop the ceftriaxone and vancomycin and narrow to a very narrow spectrum penis, um, antibiotic like penicillin. Narrowing to a narrow spectrum antibiotic will overall reduce drug resistance uh, in the patient and in um, a larger community setting. And in here, we have less gram negative coverage and would lower our risk of Clostridium difficile colitis. Things like ceftriaxone, third generation cephalosporin put you at risk for things like C. diff. So we've talked about antibiotics as a treatment, but what about corticosteroids? So there's actually some nice data to suggest that corticosteroids can be effective for the treatment of meningitis. So although we like our immune system to help us cure infections, the inflammatory response can be harmful, and that's what often happens in meningitis, particularly in patients who have streptococcus pneumoniae, um, Early on when they're infected, there's not a huge inflammatory response. The polysaccharide capsule is a low ant is low, has low antigenicity, um, but the internal components have high antigenicity. So early on, you may have low um, a lower inflammatory response. But if you give antibiotics, which breaks open the cell wall and lets the internal contents, which are very highly antigenic, come out you can significantly increase your inflammatory response and, re and cause a lot of morbidity. So if you give steroids before antibiotics, you can tone down the immune system just enough that it actually improves both morbidity and mortality in patients with streptococcus pneumoniae meningitis. How do you prevent bacterial meningitis altogether? Well, you can enhance immunity, do things like give vaccines. You can prevent transmission, so you could put on in a barrier um, like, a rest, uh, uh, like a mask to prevent droplets, or you can eradicate a reservoir. For example, in, in women who have group B strep colonization, you could give them antibiotics prior to delivery to eliminate that um, reservoir so it won't infect the neonate. And then you can treat an infection before it's disease. So when we term sometimes infections, we can say maybe it's colonization. So maybe somebody who was exposed to a patient with Neisseria meningitidis and potentially now is colonized, if you treat them and eradicate that colonization before they go on to develop meningitis, you can also prevent infection. So specifically, how do we prevent neonatal meningitis? We talked about preventing transmission by screening for group B strep and giving antibiotics to the mother. Mothers who have maternal fever, fevers are at high risk for having group B strep infection, and they will also get antibiotics. And then the infants are monitored very closely. And if they started showing signs of infection, they would get empiric antibiotics. And educate women about high-risk foods um, for Listeria, like cold-cut meats, uh, and then be aware of outbreaks for other types of foods that might be contaminated with Listeria. How about preventing H flu type B infection? Again, enhancing immunity here, there's an excellent conjugate vaccine um, that has essentially eradicated H flu type B as a cause of meningitis in many parts of the world. And again, this is a table showing that between 1986 in 1995, after the meningitis vaccine was introduced, you could see there was a near eradication of um, meningitis in this age group. This dramatic reduction was seen. And then also, during exposure, it's recommended to use droplet precaution masks to not transmit. And following exposure, chemoprophylaxis for close contacts, like we'll talk about with Neisseria meningitidis. So Neisseria meningitidis, conjugate vaccine also exists. It's recommended in children at, starting at 11 years, but also those who have asplenia, complement deficiencies, like we talked about terminal complement deficiency being a risk factor for, meningit for Neisseria meningitidis infection, or traveling to a high-risk area. If you're involved in an exposure, you'd want to um, prevent yourself from getting infected from the infected patient by wearing a droplet um, precautions mask. And if you've been exposed, you can take chemoprophylaxis or antibiotics in case you do have the carrier state to prevent subsequent infections. Antibiotics we use in this situation in adults are often ciprofloxacin, which is a fluoroquinolone, 
Um, in children, we often can use rifampin or um, ceftriaxone. How about strep pneumo? Strep pneumo, again, we want to enhance immunity, and there's some excellent vaccines out there. Um, there's a conjugate vaccine with 13 serotypes that are given to infants, immunocompromised, and actually the conjugate vaccine um, is now being given to uh, elderly patients as well, and some recommendations have recently been changed. So this is to summarize how you prevent bacterial meningitis. Again, for strep pneumo, we screen pregnant women and give peripartum antibiotics. For E. coli, which is also happens in the um, neonates, again, maternal antibiotics of fever, strep pneumo, um, vaccination, Neisseria meningitis, vaccines, chemoprophylaxis, droplet precautions, same for H. flu, and for Listeria, avoiding high-risk foods and getting peripartum antibiotics um, if there seems to be infection in the mother or infant.